Thank you all for joining us today for what's going to be a great conversation about a really engaging and and a uh, book that maybe should have been written before John got to it in the last 75 years since the war, Dogfight Over Tokyo. Uh, it's a great book. He is uh, the author of many books, John Wukovitz. He came to us about 10 years ago. We were just talking about this. He came and visited the museum and gave a presentation on his Pappy Boyington book. And uh, we have not managed to get him back here. We tried and he was gonna come in April of this year. Uh, but of course things got a little out of hand and we had to postpone that event indefinitely to talk on one of his other books. But um, I'm sure most of our viewers today know many of John's books. Um, Hell from the Heroes, uh, for, I'm sorry, Hell from the Heavens for Crew and Country, and then Tin Can Titans, which won the Samuel Elliott Morrison Naval Literature Award that year it came out, uh, probably the most prestigious award that is awarded uh, regarding naval history. So congratulations on that, many years, uh, many years belated. Um, as I mentioned, John was supposed to come here in April and thankfully we've been able to work with our colleagues in the distance learning team, Chrissy and Kate, to bring these programs to you all. Um, this one specifically has to do with our theme of the end of the war, the 75th anniversary of the end of the war. And we're gonna get right to it so we can try to get as many of the audience's questions asked and answered by John. But I'm gonna start off with a uh, handful of my own questions first. Uh, John, let's uh, give the audience a brief summary for those who have not yet read the book. Uh, give them a brief summary of Dogfight Over Tokyo, please. Well, it, it, it's uh, the dogfight over Tokyo explains the story of the last four Americans to die in war combat in World War II. Now, the, um, it, it, by that, I, I, I don't mean to say they were the last four men to die uh, ever. Um, this is in combat. We had thousands, obviously, of veterans who uh, through the decades have passed away from injuries and wounds they received during the war. But these are the last four to actually be in a, a combat action and then uh, die. And so I tell the story of those four. I also interweave with that the story of the air group of which they were a part, air group 88. And, and you and I will explain that a little bit more uh, later, uh, their activities in the final two months of the war. The book shows how a bunch of young aviators, you know, hot stuff, uh, arrogant, they're uh, bragging, they're ready to go to war, eager to get over there. And they, they really were because they wanted to match their flying skills against Japanese pilots. It shows the gradual transformation of that attitude towards a more of, uh, hey, <laughs> I don't want to be here kind of a, a, a feeling. So I take the reader through uh, from training in the United States and then to Hawaii and Saipan. After that, they join the carrier Yorktown and operate off the coast of Japan in the final couple months of the war. So basically that's what the book is, is about. Great. Uh, what brought you to this book? Why did you decide to write it um, when you did? And what resources were out there? What did you use? Okay, I, I first came across this idea um, maybe 10, 12 years ago when I was researching for a biography of Admiral Halsey uh, that, that came out, I think, in 2010. And in there, Halsey mentions in his autobiography that um, uh, on the final day of war, uh, some pilots were killed, and he said, they should never be forgotten. And that struck me. So I put that idea, you know, I filed it away because I had other projects coming up. And then finally, a few years back, I turned to it and thought, well, it's an intriguing idea if I could find out enough material to flesh out these four aviators. I mean, they obviously did not survive the war. So what about family? Fortunately, you know, I thought to myself, if I can find two of the four and get enough information on that, it'll work. And I did, I, have, I found uh, plenty of information from two of the four families. And so that enabled me to um, flesh out those two plus other material on uh, the, uh, uh, the third and the fourth aviator as well. 
So I, I, I picked up from Kokomo, the Hobbs family had uh, Billy Hobbs's diary and flight log and photographs and letters and all kinds of things. I interviewed Billy Hobbs's sister, Nancy, who I uh, just communicated with her a couple days ago. She's in mid nineties and going strong. The Mandeberg family, yeah, here we have a picture there of uh, Dwight Billy Hobbs. Uh, his first name was Dwight. Everyone called him Billy. And um, he, he was a guy who just loved aviation. Uh, his sister Nancy said, Billy was born to fly. Uh, as a kid, he made those planes out of balsa wood. Jeremy, I, that may be before your time. I don't know. <laughs> but I used to love playing with those uh, things. And he'd make aircraft out of anything. A nearby airfield, uh, he would run out to watch the planes land, or especially when barnstormers were coming through town uh, in Kokomo, Indiana. So he just always, everything about him was, hey, I want to fly. I, I love the excitement, uh, the thrill. Um, and so that, that was what Billy Hobbs is all about. Then I contacted the Mandeberg family, and you have a photo there of uh, Eugene Mandeberg. And he was quite opposite from Billy. Whereas Billy was all excitement, action, he, you know, he had a good time dating girls and, and things like that. Eugene, he was someone who, you know, you, you, you called Eugene. You didn't say, hey, Gene, come over here. It was Eugene. He was serious, studious. He loved reading books. He wanted to be a writer and, in effect, was. He wrote some columns for the Michigan Daily newspaper, which is on the campus at Ann Arbor University of Michigan. And he, he had a, a, a sharp wit, but not the kind that said, hey, I have a great story to tell you. Did you hear the joke about blah, blah, blah? It was, he'd watch and comment on what people were doing or how they said something or, or things like that. His stories were all about social ills of the time. He, he wrote a short story about a lynching in Georgia and you know, all the evils of that. And another story about a young soldier uh, who went off to training camp and came home with a sharpshooter medal and was bragging to his mom and she was worried and he said, mom, don't worry, we're only shooting at targets. And you know, she said, well, geez, my God, he doesn't even understand what he's about to get into. So Eugene was a serious one. Whereas Billy wanted to get into fighters, fighter aircraft specifically, to match his skills with a Japanese pilot in, in aerial combat, Eugene got into fighters because he did not want to fly a torpedo plane or a dive bomber where you had two or three men, as whichever plane we're talking about. He said, I don't want to be responsible for anyone else's death in the air, so I'll fly a fighter. Then you had the third one um, was, um, let's say, I'm not sure which picture you have coming up here. The uh, Joe Saloff, who was from New York, and Joe was uh, one of those um, cocky aviators. You know, you watch Tom Cruise in the Top Gun kind of a thing, and just the way they act was pretty much how he was. He always had a, a cigar, it seemed. <clears throat> of course, that picture does not have a cigar, but um, uh, he, he was known for that. At a party in the um, United States, just before they were going to go over to the Pacific, <clears throat> Joe Saloff, uh, uh, he was the wingman for the squadron commander, Richard Cromlin. He told Cromlin's wife, I promise you I will bring him back home safely. Well, that didn't turn out uh, in, in one of the actions. Uh, their planes uh, knocked uh, slightly into each other and Cromlin went spinning to his death. The fourth one, Howdy Harrison, was a veteran aviator, had already seen some action in the Pacific, and he was a father of a couple children. One, now Howdy in that picture is in the middle, being held up in celebratory fashion by his, his buddies aboard the Yorktown. He had been the subject of a fascinating rescue at sea. Uh, while they were off the coast of Japan. 
Uh, he had to land his plane in the Sea of Japan uh, and, and a, a Catalina, a Dumbo, the, the nickname of the aircraft, flew across uh, through thick overcast. It was, it was horrible conditions, uh, but they succeeded in rescuing him pretty much right from under the noses of the Japanese defenses, the way the newspapers described it. He had um, two children, one he had never seen because the child was born after they went to uh, the Pacific. So those are the four aviators. The book focuses on the first two, uh, uh, Billy Hobbs and Eugene Mandeberg. And it was interesting when they were in training, Eugene Mandeberg met a gal in New York City, Sonia Levine, and uh, they fell in love and planned to be married once he returned. And so that's a, a, a prominent feature in the book. They obviously did not get married, but it turned out that Sonia was still alive and, and, and is today um, in New York City. So I was able to interview uh, Sonia about her recollections of her love from uh, 75 years ago. Yeah, one of, the, one of the things about the book that really drew me in is basically what we do here at the museum by sharing the personal stories, by using those personal accounts and the fact that we do have the fortune of being around those who were living during that time. Uh, John, you had mentioned they were operating off the coast of Japan. Um, when we think of the air war over Japan, I think nine out of nine people would probably think of the B-29 raids that were launching from the Marianas Islands. Um, tell us a little bit about these operations. What was the purpose? How close were they getting? Uh, just tell us about the operations beyond the B-29 uh, heavy bombers. Yeah, these, these were quite different, obviously. The uh, smaller aircraft, fighters, uh, torpedo planes, and dive bombers, they had, under Admiral Halsey, uh, the third fleet was stationed off the coast of Japan. And since it was a fast carrier task force, they could attack one installation factory shipyard in Japan and then a couple days later be two, 300 miles away and attack something else. Their purpose before the atom bombs were dropped was to hit these targets, these military uh, installations, armaments, factories, uh, et cetera, to prepare the way for the scheduled November invasion of Japan itself which was supposed to be a massive operation, obviously. So their purpose was uh, eliminate as many of those military targets as possible. After the atom bombs were dropped, it changed. Instead of hitting those targets to prepare for the uh, eventual invasion, they were to hit those targets to prod the Japanese to the peace table. Keep hitting them hard. Halsey kept saying that, we gotta keep hitting them with everything we've got. Even on the last day of the war, he said, do you think we have enough left to, for one more strike to get it in? Um, he was under orders to do that. Um, but as, as a, a policy had some ulterior motives, and I don't know if you want me to do, get into that now we'll, or later. We'll get to yeah. Admiral Halsey uh, later as we talk about the, the decision to launch the mission. Okay, we'll do that later? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Right. Um, now, so the... the, the, the uh, Air Group 88, off the coast of Japan, their normal operation, each strike was, or each mission day, they'd have a morning and an afternoon strike. It would entail three parts. There would be two sweeps by fighter aircraft of the target area to eliminate anti-aircraft batteries and clear the way for the dive bombers and torpedoes to follow, torpedo planes to follow. They would have one of those in the morning, two sweeps, followed by the strike of the dive bombers and torpedo planes. They would then have another one in the afternoon. Uh, they had 12 of those in the little more than a month that they were off the coast of, of Japan. The, um, the missions they were running, just for our, our non-Pacific historians, but the more European audience members that are watching today, reminded me a lot of the pre-D-Day invasion in Normandy and the missions that they were, uh, yeah. that the US Air Force and the RAF was launching, the 8th Air Force, the 9th Air Force to blow bridges and communication centers and to basically soften up the landing ground. That, that's, that's a great comparison. 
Um, so they were on uh, the CV-10, the Yorktown. Um, tell us, they had a lot of time in between missions. They had a lot of time to ship out uh, from the United States. Tell us about life on board <laughs> with the crew, ma uh, crew members of the Yorktown. Yeah, they, as I said, they had uh, the 12 strike days, the mission days. And they were there about, we'll say five weeks. So there, there was time while the carrier was moving into position for another attack. Um, the air group, first of all, aboard an aircraft carrier, you had pretty much had two crews. You had the ship's company of about 2,700 officers and enlisted. The ship's company, their task was to take care of the carrier and get it ready to launch aircraft. Nothing more than that. They existed for the air group. The air group was a separate crew of about 300 aviators divided into four squadrons, a fighter squadron, bombing squadron, torpedo planes, and then what was called a, a bombing fighting squadron of Corsair aircraft. They were a separate section aboard the carrier. Now the Yorktown's ship's company would stay with the Yorktown for the duration. Air groups generally were aboard a carrier for maybe up to six months, and then they were rotated out so that they could teach what they knew to training aviators and be incorporated into other squadrons because they wanted some experienced uh, flyers in there. In their off time, I'll call it, they were generally in the ready room. There were four ready rooms, one for each of the four squadrons. Those ready rooms were, you know, like I, I was at the Yorktown, it's floating uh, berthed off of uh, at Patriots Point there in South Carolina. Uh, they're not as large as we might think. Uh, they're cluttered, uh, but they spent all their time there. That's where they would go to get all the final information before a mission. And in the meantime, they would be there playing cards or smoking or teasing one another or whatever the case may be. So uh, the aviators that I interviewed told me, well, yeah, that was pretty much our home base, the, the ready room. We had ours and then the dive bomber pilots had theirs, et cetera, et cetera. So that was pretty much it. Their routine for the time that they were off the coast of Japan, um, a few hours of intense, lethal activity interspersed with many hours of, um, hey, let's fill the time with whatever we can. The, um, the timeline, I think, is important. I think uh, in most popular memory, you have August 6th as the Hiroshima bombing and August 9th as the Nagasaki bombing. And of course, that led to the Japanese decision to surrender. But uh, there is this week plus lull um, in between where the uh, first bombs dropped and the actual emperor's message is broadcast. Um, and I think that gets us to the August 15th mission. Can you give us a little bit of uh, background on that mission? And then get into um, as you said, they were, they were, they were continuing to deliver uh, their payloads on the Japanese because they had not surrendered. But talk a little bit about that window and, and, I'll ask a, a follow-up question when you finish. Yeah, sure. The, um, first of all, the missions, there's a nice map of the, the final um, flight. Their missions, <clears throat> excuse me, when they first arrived were against um, general targets uh, uh, that they wanted to soften up for the invasion. After the atom bombs, the, the flyers, everybody, the ship's company as well, they wanted to get out of there. I mean, hey, the war is practically over. Let's not keep this up. Why do we need to attack an airfield when an atom bomb has wiped out two cities? And so they couldn't understand the necessity for keeping to go out and face these anti-aircraft batteries. Now, you, you, you have to try and understand what it's like to fly into that, into that flak, you know, anti-aircraft barrier shooting straight up at you and, and you're diving down and you can't weave to avoid the fire because the planes have to lock in on their targets. So you just, as one um, aviator told me, he said, there's, there's no skill to it. It's just luck, pure luck. We hated every minute of it. 
Well, these guys didn't want to sacrifice their lives when the war was going to end any time, but they followed orders, obviously. And um, they went out on a couple of missions after the atom bombs were dropped and a couple of guys were killed. August 14th, one of the men recorded in his diary, God, I hope we don't have to go out on another mission tomorrow. And then he added a little bit later in his diary, well, Father Moody, that was a Catholic chaplain aboard your account, just came by to say, no dice, we're going on a strike. And the next morning they had to do that. Now Hobbs was with a team, Hobbs, Mandeberg, Harrison, and Saloff were with a team of 12 Hellcat fighters. Hobbs was not supposed to be on this flight. He was scheduled for a later day. Another team of four was supposed to go. But Howdy Harrison, this, the team leader of, of which Hobbs was a part, traded places with that other team because he said, hey, Billy needs one more mission for promotion to Lieutenant JG. He was an ensign. He, he needs one more to get promoted to Lieutenant JG. So will you switch with me? Well, that other team was happy to switch. Billy wasn't necessarily <laughs> overwhelmed with joy at this, but it was arranged and off they went, <clears throat> excuse me, even though one of the pilots uh, said, is this really necessary? Well, they took off a little bit after four o'clock in the morning, the 12 Hellcats did. It was a cloudy day. So as he got closer to Japan, two of the 12 Hellcats were ordered to a higher altitude so that they could relay messages to and from the carrier Yorktown. So now the Hellcat number was down to 10 that proceeded on to the target. After that, a team of four led by a guy named Marvin Odom became lost and the action report put it somewhat unusually. It said Odom's team became lost in a, and these are the quotes, a finger of overcast. And I was never sure what to make of that. That doesn't sound like a very um, cloudy area, but that uh, he became lost and those four planes were now gone. The Hellcat number was down to six that continued toward their target, which on the map that is uh, showing was just south of Tokyo, uh, a little bit to the northeast of the dotted line there. So they continued on toward um, Tokyo. And as they got near Atsugi Airfield, they were ready to attack, getting ready to attack when the commander contacted them and said, hey, stop. We just received word the Japanese have agreed to cessation of hostilities. Abort your mission and return to the carrier. Of course, that news he laid it all of them, all six of them. They, you know, hey, we're going to get back. We survived the war. We're going to be going home. Well, you know, all those thoughts uh, went uh, screaming through their minds. They turned back, and you can see on the map there, just north of Atsugi Airfield, <clears throat> and were on their way out to Tokyo Bay when 15 to 20 Japanese fighters uh, jumped them. They became involved in a furious dogfight. The um, Joe Saloff, um, uh, one of the men who survived, said he saw Joe Saloff's plane going down over Tokyo Bay, but Saloff parachuted out. He saw that, but that's all he knew. Then that same pilot saw another Hellcat explode in the air. But that guy got out by parachuting as well. Two, the other two of the Hellcats to be down that day were uh, Hellcats that smashed into farmland or uh, terrain right around the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Yokohama Nasi, Nasimachi area there. So that left two guys who got back to the carrier Yorktown, four who did not, four who were shot down. The air group was crestfallen. <laughs> One of the guys said, you know, this was supposed to be our happiest day the war's over, but it wasn't. It was our saddest day. Because not only do we lose four good friends, but we lost some in the final moments. 
technically, you could say that these four were shot down after the war ended, if you want to, because they had been alerted that the Japanese had agreed to hostilities, a uh, secession, secession of hostilities, but they hadn't yet officially signed the surrender document, obviously, that was in September. So they, they were crestfallen. The, um, one of the survivors, uh, Marvin Odom, whose team was lost in a finger of overcast, said an interesting thing. He, he said he heard that Howdy Harrison said to the other guys, once they learned the war is over, hey, let's continue on and, and take a tour over Tokyo. And then they got shot down. Well, I spent some time in the book explaining why that was just not feasible. First of all, how would Odom know what he told those guys? Odom was already going back to the carrier, that kind of thing. Secondly, who's going to take a tour of, over anti-aircraft batteries that had been firing away at you all war, now manned by Japanese who were angry about surrendering? I talked to a Vietnam aviator who flew over 100 missions over North Vietnam, and he, I asked him, if you got that message, you know, let's go on a tour, what would you do? So I'd turn around on, on my own and go back. I'd never go on a tour. Uh, we, we would get out of there as fast as we can. Well, while all that was going on, there were two Japanese farmers tending their field, and they saw this dogfight occur, and one of the planes crashed not far from their field. They went over and inspected, and it was, you know, it was a plane in a, hundreds of pieces and, and things. So they contacted Japanese officials who came out, and when it cooled, they gathered up the remains of a person. But there was <clears throat> no head, no limbs, just the trunk was all. So no identification could be made. The Japanese did, they wrapped it up uh, in, in matting and carried that to the local Buddhist shrine uh, for the Buddhist monk to take care of. Uh, so they uh, properly uh, took care of the remains of whoever that particular uh, pilot was. Now, while everybody in the United States, everybody in the Pacific was celebrating the end of the war, well, everybody in the Pacific who was from the United States and Great Britain, et cetera, the um, people back home, like in Kokomo, Billy Hobbs' hometown, they threw an all-night celebration. Cars, after midnight, drove through town honking their horns, and uh, booze freely flowed, and everybody was having a good time. The Hobbs and Manderberg families couldn't celebrate. They were happy. They assumed their sons were safe because, I mean, let's face it, what are the odds of my son is going to die in the final moments of war? Nah, that's not going to happen, but still cautious. We, we, don't, we don't have word. Let's wait till we find out word. Well, in the coming days, other families received word from their loved ones that, hey, I'm okay. I'll be coming home sooner or later. They didn't. In fact, some of the letters written to Billy Hobbs for his birthday, which happened to be August 15th, the day he was shot down, that was his 22nd birthday, some of the letters and cards for that were returned to the Hobbs family with that horrible stamp, returned to sender. And they're going, well, what? what's going on? It wasn't until September that the government officially informed them that those four pilots were uh, missing in action. They couldn't be declared dead because there were no remains. So they had to keep them on the books for a year and one day as missing. And then on August 16th, 1946 is when they officially declared them missing. Now, since um, the families buried mementos and memories instead of the actual remains, open wounds persisted for a long time. Both Hattie Hobbs, the mom of Billy, and Zelda Mandenberg, Eugene's mom, <clears throat> truly believed one day their sons would come walking through the front door. They never gave up that hope. They knew it wasn't realistic, but moms being moms, you know, they, they you know, Nancy, uh, Hobbs told me mom was always out on the front porch. She thought Billy would come walking up the, the uh, pathway there. 
every year on the anniversary of that death, August 15th, Hattie Hobbs had a poem printed in the Kokomo newspaper to honor her son. <clears throat> Now, 1946, an Army Graves Registration Team recovered the remains of that pilot um, that uh, crashed in the, the farmland. They took those remains eventually to the Philippines and buried them, along with the remains, which they couldn't identify because DNA was not in existence then. They did recover some pieces of the aircraft that indicated probably is how they said it. the plane came from Yorktown and that it was a Hellcat. So it was one of the three, Saloff parachuted into Tokyo Bay and was gone. It was one of either Hobbs, Mandeberg, or Harrison. The, um, eventually the government's DNA team caught up with everything. And just two weeks ago, I was informed that they have those remains in Hawaii and are testing them. They've already taken DNA samples from the Hobbs, Mandeberg, et cetera, families. And hopefully they'll come to a conclusion on who that person is. And one family at least will get that kind of closure. It's, a, uh, it's an important mission that the uh, DOD still carries on. Actually a, a quick sidebar, the museum is in partnership with that agency, the Defense POW MIA. Excellent accounting agency, the yeah. DPA. We have a research historian here, a postdoc uh, young man who is helping them research the last actions of those who were fallen and remain un yeah. unidentified. Uh, so uh, hopefully we'll, we'll figure out which one of those three boys it was and they'll, the family will be able to have a proper burial. Uh, yeah. John, a, a couple follow-ups on that. You had mentioned uh, the celebrations, obviously for the allied side. Um, what, what was your uh, experience with any Japanese archives? Or We had an interview a couple weeks ago on the uh, anniversary of the sinking of the USS Indianapolis, and the co-authors mentioned that the sub-commander came home, even though he had just sunk a big capital ship, he came home feeling dejected as a loser because they had lost the war. Uh, was there a Japanese reaction, or were they happy that they got kills in the closing days of the war, closing no. hours? Yeah, the main reaction would have been the, the, the former, the first one you mentioned, um, uh, the indignity of losing. Uh, Saburo Sakai, I think it was, he said that all of us were willing to fight to the death and now we had to uh, surrender. It was, excuse me, hard for them to handle that. And that's why you had some of the incidents of some Japanese uh, planes attacking different uh, uh, areas possibly the 15 or 20 who attacked the Hobbs group may have had that as a reason of vengeance for having to surrender. But they, they certainly considered it a loss of face and only hearing the emperor's words uh, pretty much was, was sealed, okay, we've got to accept, as the emperor said, the, um, uh, you know, uh, we have to endure the unendurable kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. the, um, the biggest, name, the greatest man in your book, uh, is one of the most venerated in American military history, uh, Admiral Bull Halsey. Uh, he plays quite a role in your book, and a uh, controversial one at that. How does, it, how does it tie in? How does he tie in? That it does. Uh, yeah, now, um, as I mentioned, I did a biography of Halsey earlier. Uh, he, I have long loved reading about Admiral Halsey. A uh, fascinating guy, uh, aggressive, he, he sort of almost invented the sound bite years before that was even a phrase. He, he was quotable to, in the press. Uh, newspaper correspondents loved chatting with him because he would uh, give them something to chew on, um, quite often laced with profanities. I mean, if we put an actual quote of Halsey's up on this screen, <laughs> there have to be asterisks and question marks and exclamation marks all over the place to <laughs> fill in for the customers. He, in the early two years of the war, he brought American morale back up after Pearl Harbor. He did a marvelous job, and for that alone, he deserves a place in the pantheon of naval heroes. He um, attacked some uh, early island raids uh, in early 1942, and uh, he took Doolittle's raiders out to uh, launch on their 
a bombing raid over Tokyo. Uh, he went down to the South Pacific as the commander of the South Pacific and turned around the situation there. So he contributed greatly and, and uh, home front made him a big hero. Well, then after that, he started making a few mistakes. He blundered at the Battle of Lady Gulf, Samar portion of the Battle of Lady Gulf, by leaving his post to chase after aircraft carriers. So he had missed out both the Battle of the Coral Sea and Midway. So he wanted to crack at Japanese carriers before the war ended. So he went chasing off after that, and that allowed Admiral Kurita to storm through the San Bernardino Strait. And only the courageous actions of Taffy Three, um, Admiral Sprague, and the ships that Jim Hornfisher is so nobly mentioned in Tin Can's Last Stand of the Tin Can Sailors, uh, they, they prevented complete disaster there. So Halsey was criticized for that. Then in December of 44 and June of 45, he led his ships into two typhoons, which one of them caused considerable damage to ships and lives. He would have been sacked, but he was such a home front hero that Admiral King in Washington said, we've got to keep him on, we, we can't get rid of him. So for Halsey, his station off the coast of Japan was a chance at redemption. Aha, my reputation is tarnished, but now if, if I can finish off the Japanese fleet, if I can pound them till the last day of the war, I'll redeem and salvage my reputation. Therefore, some of his judgments, you know, according to Air Group 88, and uh, every man I talk to in Air Group 88 condemns Halsey uh, without blinking an eye. It's just that's their instant reaction. I blame him for the deaths, that kind of thing. Because the weapon that Halsey was using to help regain a reputation were the aviators, Billy Hobbs, Eugene Mandiburg, et cetera. And so there's that controversy. Was he correct in doing that? Well, he was under orders. Nimitz and King uh, told him to do this, so you have to follow orders. But the question is, were those orders even appropriate when there was so little left of, of anything uh, to hit? So that's a controversy. It was hard for me to write that section. I was writing a book about Air Group 88, and so I had to write it from their point of view, their anger at this admiral that I think deserves a little bit of a break because of the first two years of the war, the contributions he made there. But still, you talk to Group 88, and there's Bill Watkinson lives at Patriots Point, you talk to him today, <laughs> you know, watch out for what he might say. Um, Lieutenant Commander Hennessy in Virginia, the same thing. Uh, so he did pound the Japanese Navy, the remnants of the Japanese Navy pretty much out of existence. And so he did achieve a lot under the orders he was given. But some say he went too far. He could have canceled at least that last strike when the Japanese were literally hours from saying, all right, we give up. So to, to your point, uh, my second to last question here, and then I'll close with a final question after we get to some audience questions. Um, sadly, there must be somebody who is the last person to die in a war. Uh, and these four men, as far as the combat hours are concerned, were the last four in the Pacific Theater. Um, was this a mistake? If it was a mistake, it was only a mis it was a mistake made by superior command, yeah, a senior command uh, by either King Nimitz or Halsey. It was not a mistake by the aviators. It, it was a tragic event, I'll say. The um, um, that they went out, they, they didn't want to, but they did what they were supposed to do. They did their duty. And so that in itself is admirable. I mean, I, I, in talking about this, I, I often think of a band of brothers and you probably know the episode about the river and sending men out for, to capture a German prisoner of war. Why do we do this? The uh, war is almost over. And that commander, uh, Captain Winters, canceled the mission. I, you know, the, the, the aviators of Air Group 88 would have loved to have had Captain Winters in command, I suppose. So what they did was, was 
not a mistake. They were doing their duty and their deaths certainly were not in vain, even though it, it should never have happened. Uh, Jean Mandeberg, spelled J-E-A-N, Eugene's niece, today is quite an artist out on the West Coast. And, and she said, uh, she said, John, as I was growing up, I just, I knew about e Eugene and I felt him within me, you know, uh, he was driving me to do something creative. He wanted to be a writer and never got the chance. So I must be an artist to at least have someone doing something creative like that to honor his memory. Natalie Schneider was Billy Hobbs's grand niece. And don't ask me to figure out who she is <laughs> later. Anyway, they told the family told me she was the grand niece. I think she's in college now, but uh, when she wrote the paper, she was a, a freshman in high school. It was for English honors class, and they could write a paper about anything. She told chose as her topic an imaginary scene where Hattie Hobbs, Billy's mom is telling Billy's siblings, including Nancy, that Billy's dead, you know, that he was killed. And Natalie, you know, 60 years later, she's writing about something that obviously has meant so much to that family. Because of these things, Sonia Levine, the girl who was supposed to marry Eugene, and the Mandebergs, Jean Mandeberg and her family, united. They've gotten together all, after all these years and shared all kinds of information. And they did it thinking, you know, Eugene is reaching out across all these decades to bring us together. Even though we never got married, Sonia said, uh, he was the first great love of my life and I have never forgotten him. Now she went on to, to be married to someone else, had a wonderful life and still does in New York City. And just yesterday, after you and I talked a little bit, Jeremy, I got an email from Carrie Hobbs from Kokomo, just saying, hey, August 15th is coming up Saturday. Uh, thanks for writing the book. A lot of people in town are coming up to us and telling us what a remarkable thing Billy Hobbs did and just how much the family appreciates that after these decades, Billy is being recognized for what he did. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's too much in vain right here, um, uh, for these pilots. It was certainly a tragedy, but as you said, someone has to be the final to die, and unfortunately, these four were. Well, as you started this conversation, John, uh, you had said that there was a goal to make sure that these four were not forgotten. With your uh, wonderful book, Dogfight Over Tokyo, I think you've ensured that for the next couple hundred years, as long as there are books or Kindles, um, yeah. Those four will not be forgotten. So thank you very much for this presentation. We have a few questions. Uh, I'm gonna start with one from Mike, who's watching on Facebook. He's curious about the degree of information air combat inf information officers had about the location of potential POW camps and how the pilots processed this information. Uh, if you came across anything with the POW camps, did they, did any of them, Air Group 88, write about or talk about the anxiety of hitting, striking near them or striking on them? Yeah, they, they knew the location of many, I, I don't want to say every single one, and tried to avoid it. Um, the interesting thing was that after August 15th, the other aviators of Air Group 88, especially of the fighting squadron, they scoured Japan. They went to every prison camp they could. They checked every record they could. You know, can we find Billy Hobbs, Eugene Mandeberg, et cetera, et cetera. So they did know the location of many of these and um, did want, go out and check to see maybe they were shot down and captured and they're still alive. Unfortunately, that didn't pan out. Did any of the men um, comment or, or leave journals about, uh, and not just the four who died, but any 88 about uh, the, the potential of striking their own comrades who were in the... No, no specific comment that I came across. I read a lot of diaries and, and letters and I did not uh, see one. Great. And I see that our, uh, our wonderful helpers, Chrissy and Kate, have just put the link to 
your book in our store. Of course, all Thank the you. purchases at our, uh, our web store support the museum's educational mission. So we hope you check that out. We have a question from Anthony, who's watching the, uh, the Zoom here. Do we know whether the Japanese pilots who attacked our planes knew that the emperor had surrendered before they took off? How much after the broadcast of the emperor's surrender message did the dogfight occur? Yeah, the, the, the high likelihood is how I'll put it. I can't say 100% certainty was yes, they, they knew about it and they went out uh, uh, hunting for something. Um, uh, I didn't find anything in any records of the, uh, that air group that indicated, all right, we're going out to uh, seek vengeance, but it was likely that that was the case. Uh, in my book, that's how I put it, that uh, it could have been for some other reason. Maybe they didn't know about it, but probably they did. Um, we have an, another question from Mike here. Uh, he's interested in the research process for the strike reconstruction. I think he's referencing the map uh, that you used in the book. Was this all from after action reports? Um, did you put it through the flight logs? Just tell us about how you came up with that. Yeah, it was the after action reports were fascinating. And in most of my information came from those. An after action report was filed um, by each squadron, by each aviator after a particular action was carried out. And so you go to those. The flight logs didn't help a whole bunch. First of all, these four pilots um, uh, never made it back and they changed their path, their flight route there. Uh, and, um, and so there was nothing much in the flight logs. So it was reliance strictly on what the survivors, um, Odom, uh, Hanson, uh, Proctor, uh, those men, uh, what they wrote. And by that, I could get a description. Uh, if an action, after action report said that the pilots were 10 miles southwest of Atsugi Airfield, then I knew how to plot that on the map. If Murray Odom said we, we were attacked five miles east of Atsugi Airfield, I knew how to route that on that final map as well. So it was a, a combination of the official records plus personal re uh, reminiscences. Great. Um, John, I know the answer to this because we're in communication, but I think the audience would like to know uh, what's next. And I understand there's two things in the works. There are two things. Um, they, they sort of happened coincidentally, you know, and at the same time with the same publisher. The, uh, the, the one I'm currently in, immersed in is a biography of a Marine officer named General Lewis Chesty Polar who is considered the Marine's Marine. He's a legend in the Marine Corps. Uh, he was awarded five Navy crosses uh, for his actions in, in uh, Nicaragua and in the Pacific. Uh, he, he was um, all kinds of other medals. The men loved him. Uh, he was um, someone who would rather hang around with the privates and corporals than with, especially with the staff back at headquarters. They drove him nuts. Uh, but I'm doing a biography on that for Dutton. Uh, they're doing a series on uh, great war commanders uh, to be um, out in paperback version next, early next year sometime. The other one involves Eddie Rickenbacker. Now, some in the audience will know Eddie Rickenbacker, a, a famous car racer, Indianapolis 500 <clears throat> participant who then in World War I became the leading American ace, uh, you know, chasing after um, uh, German pilots and things like that. Well, in 1942, Eddie Rickenbacker went on a, a secret mission for the government. They asked him to fly over to the South Pacific and deliver a message to General MacArthur. On his way out, the plane had a, made a crash landing. They ran out of fuel. Uh, they, they couldn't locate one of the interim destinations. They overshot it because of navigation mistakes. They were lost at sea for three weeks. Uh, by they, I mean uh, a, a group of eight men that were on the plane. Newspapers in the United States uh, it 
actually when I started researching this was just about the time Kobe Bryant died and the reaction to Eddie Rickenbacker's death was even more so than that. All newspapers covered it and eventually they gave up hope and some even printed obituaries of Eddie Rickenbacker. Well, they were found after three weeks at sea and made it back. So when I explained this to the editor, you know, he said, well, I've never even heard of this. Uh, it's, it's a great tale. And fortunately, there's all kinds of information. Five of the eight men, one did die during his time in the Pacific. Five of the seven who survived wrote books about it, small books. And I've been in contact with four of the families uh, to get other information. So those are the next two books I'll be doing. Great. We have a, uh, well, we're looking forward to both of them. And um, hopefully by then we'll be hosting the public programs in person and we can bring you back for one or maybe get a twofer out of you. Uh, I'm all fine with that. <laughs> uh, Michael has a question on Zoom here. Were you able to identify the Japanese pilots in the attack? No, no. And can you, uh, can you talk a little bit about the Japanese records or lack thereof? Um, I didn't find many. I can find my effort to the after action reports, the war diaries, uh, ships logs, and personal reminiscences. I, I like to interview the people who were there and their families as much as possible. Understood. Um, another question from David. You mentioned a pilot had parachuted into Tokyo Bay and did not survive, one of the four. That is correct. Uh, they think it was Joe Saloff, they're almost sure. Can uh, you, can you uh, discuss? Islam parachuted out of his plane and then he lost sight of him and nothing ever turned up. Uh, was the survival rate poor for pilots bailing out over water and did not, did they, was that just par, it, par for the course that they would drown or was he possibly uh, wounded? Now, if, if they could somehow <clears throat> make it down with their plane, you know, crash land, the chances of rescue were very high. Just parachuting in the ocean, uh, the, the odds plummeted. But one chapter in the book is about air sea rescues. It's fascinating how they did that. And uh, uh, the Na U.S. Navy would go right into Tokyo Bay if a, a, a pilot was downed and was on a raft and they would just pick them up right there. So the odds were okay that way. Uh, a quick question just for clarification. The dogfight was after the surrender of uh, the broadcast of the Emperor's surrender message? Correct. Yeah. And uh, was there, is there any record of any Japanese planes shot down? This is from Amy. Uh, any Japanese planes shot down during this August 15th dogfight? The air group records indicate eight Japanese planes were shot down by the uh, six Hellcat fighters. Who did what is, is up for debate, but uh, they do indicate eight were shot down. Okay. Um, well, I don't see any more coming in uh, online and we're just hitting that one hour mark, which we want to uh, try to hit. Richard says great for answering his question. And I think that summarizes this conversation. John, you and I spoke yesterday of the house of World War II history, and there seems to be an infinite amount of doors to be open. And you have certainly found a, a, a new door a wonderful story that I think uh, really honors these four men who perished, but also the Air Group 88, the Yorktown, and all of those who served in the Pacific Theater. So thank you very much for coming to share this with us on the uh, eve of the 75th of the surrender. Um, you've, uh, as I mentioned to you, I've, I read the book, skimmed it first, read it deeper, and then really scanned it. So three times, and I picked up something new every time. I hope you all go and uh, purchase the book. Um, please join us next Wednesday for our next webinar on the Pope of Physics, the scientist Enrico, Enrico Fermi, who was involved in the Manhattan Project. That'll be at 11 a.m. Central next Wednesday. And let's all give a virtual round of applause to our <laughs> presenter and my friend, John Wukovitz. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. It's been a a pleasure, you had great questions. I know you're always prepared, um, uh, which is not always the case with some people elsewhere, but 
you I know you're top notch. So thank you and thank everyone else there at the, the staff for the help today and every other time I've been there. Great. We'll get you back soon and uh, we'll see all of you back here next Wednesday. Have a great and safe weekend.